Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name's Mary Margaret McAllen. I work here at the Whitty Museum, Director of Special Projects. And um, please continue eating. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers, and I've got a little housekeeping to do as well. So I want to say thank you um, to all of you for attending and to our very gracious sponsors who made this happen, um, namely the Elizabeth Huth Coates Charitable Foundation. This is their second year of presenting sponsor. Also, thank you to the Summerlee Foundation of Dallas, the John and Florence Newman Foundation of San Antonio, Jefferson Bank, Humanities Texas, Heritage Auctions of Dallas and everywhere, uh, the John G. and Marie Stella Kennedy Foundation uh, from Corpus, Vote Auction Galleries, Maida and Boo Hauser, Plains Capital Bank, and the Amy Shelton McNutt Foundation, as well as uh, John and Susan Kerr. Thank you also uh, to the Center the, uh, for our fabulous exhibition. If you haven't seen it, you need to go through it. The Center for Texas Studies at TCU, Texas Christian University, underwrote at the production of the uh, incredible book that will be coming out very soon um, on this exhibition in general and the art of Texas, uh, 250 years, authored by Ron Tyler. Uh, the Russell Hill Rogers Fund for the Arts, the Stillwater Foundation from Austin, the Carolyn and Houston Hart Fund, Ted and Sharon Lusher, from, also from Austin, the Sarah E. Hart and John Gutzler Fund, Brad Brewer, and Nancy and Ted Pop. So thank you to all of these sponsors. We are very grateful to them. Um, I also want to recognize the president of our board, J.J. Fike, who's with us here today, and all of you wonderful Quillen members and other supporters. Uh, who could be with us today. This has been a wonderful experience to learn and grow, uh, and learn about Texas art. The Witty, uh, we always like to say, this is a center for lifelong learning, and indeed that proves true when we put on a conference and we see people so enthusiastic, yet um, laid back and just ready to enjoy a good experience. So um, today, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce you, well, well, first before I introduce our speakers, I'm also wanting to mention that all the all the sessions and panels uh, for the last two days have been recorded, and in a couple of weeks, probably three weeks, they'll appear on the Witty uh, Museum's YouTube channel. Um, so if, if you missed a session, you can go back and watch it from your computer. Um, also, after lunch, um, Amy Fulkerson, our curator, chief curator, will be. Um, meeting people at the check-in desk, the walker desk in the, in the main um, uh, Great Hall, and she is offered to take people on a tour of our visible storage, which is just across the street. And you can see the artifacts that we store there, which aren't on exhibit currently. But it's a wonderful facility, state-of-the-art. Anyway, now, back to my purpose. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our two speakers today, photographer Kenny Braun, and author Sam Gwynn. In their stunning book on Texas landscapes, as far as you can see, together they explore a Texas that is not only instantly recognizable by the geography and light that you see in the photos, but uh, by the soul of, of how Texans feel about their state. That's what I thought when I opened the book. I thought, ah, they've got it. Kenny has traveled the length and breadth of Texas photographing its vast lands, and as far as you can see, he presents a portfolio of stunning images that captures the natural splendor of the entire state. In 2004, Sam Gwynn sojourned with Kenny on an assignment to run the Devil's River. Since that time, they've spent a lot of time collaborating on other projects. Gwynn calls Braun's efforts to photograph the landscapes in an attempt to decode Texas by taking places most familiar to most Texans, or familiar to most Texans, and show them, show it to them in a new way, in a new light. Call it the unfamiliarity of familiar places, says Gwyn. Kenny is known for environmental portraiture, landscape, and fine art photography. Music, surfing, and photography have been his passion since high school, each influencing the other. His personal work explores 
a sense of place and memory by returning to scenes from his childhood. His series on Texas surfers in the Gulf Coast titled Surf Texas was published in 2014. And his new book on Texas landscapes, as far as you can see, was published by UT Press in the spring of 2018. Brown's work is included in numerous private and public collections, including the Whitliff Collection in San Marcos at Texas State University. As an editorial photographer, his work has been seen in Garden and Gun, my favorite magazine, Texas Monthly, my other favorite magazine, Wired, Southern Living, Texas Highways, and This Hold House magazine. Now, I first met Sam when we were um, at the Tucson Book Festival in, I believe it was 2013, is that right? He had come out with his new book, Rebel Yell, and I just admired um, a panel that he sat on with Hampton Sides and some other wonderful authors, and we got to know each other. I, he writes it in his histories in a very narrative style, which I, I try to do as well when I write my books. So um, I just had admired his style. I think everybody has a copy of one of at least one of his books on our shelves. Um, he's incredibly well read, but everybody reads him as well. So he's the author of two acclaimed books on Texas history, Empire of the Summer Moon, which most of you have probably read. Um, it spent 18, 82 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And Rebel Yell, the Violence, Passion, and Redemption of Stonewall Jackson, which was published in, 20, in sep uh, September of 2014, was a, also a New York Times bestseller and was named a finalist for both the prestigious National Book Critics Award, Circle, Circle Award and the Penn Literary Award for Biography. His book, The Perfect Pass, American Genius and the Reinvention of Football was published in September 2016 and was named to a number of top 10 book sports books, book lists. Sam has written extensively for Texas Monthly, where he was executive editor from 20, 2000 to 2008. And you might know David Dunham is also on our board of directors. His work included cover stories on White House advisor Carl Rove, NASA, the King Ranch, football player Johnny Manziel, the University of Texas, and Southwest Airlines. His 2005 story on lethal Houston surgeon Eric Sheffley was published in The Best American Crime Writing in 2006 by Harper Perennial Press. In 2008, he won the National City and Regional Magazine Award for Writer of the Year. He also writes for Outside Magazine. His articles include a 2011 story about a canoe trip down the Pecos River in Texas and a 2012 piece about the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific where the Americans tested the atomic weapons. He's um, won numerous awards uh, as a correspondent. He worked for Time Magazine. He was bureau chief, national correspondent, and senior editor. Um, so he's garnered so many awards, they would run off the page if I listed them all. So please give a warm welcome to both Kenny Braun and Sam Gwynn. Thank you all for having us. We're thrilled to be here at the wonderful, witty museum. So this is the cover of my book, as far as you can see, opened up, that you can see the front and the back. And it's a landscape book. And so I had to ask myself, why am I known as a landscape photographer? And it all goes back to when I was little. So here's a short little history lesson on me. Both of my grandparents had farms about an hour and a half drive out of Houston. And we would go there and visit all the time. I would just, I love to be outdoors from sunup to sundown. Fishing, hunting, camping. There's my deer rifle. And when I was 16, that, the hunting kind of took a back seat to photography because I got this camera, Canon AE-1. They used to say it was cheating because it had automatic exposure. <laughs> but... Looking back, I, I now realize that it was kind of like hunting with a gun. You know, you're walking around looking for things to shoot. 
you uh, see a potential subject, zero in on it, and if it's a good one, you mount it <laughs> on the wall, you know, when you get home. Pressing the wrong button. That's my living room. Not really. It's Sam's living room. <laughs> so, yeah, I just started taking my camera with me everywhere, and nature was kind of just a natural subject matter for me as a photographer. So these pictures are the ones that Sam and I did together on the Devil's River. And this is from our starting point. There's, there was this bridge that went across the river. And back then, there were, there were no maps or guidelines or anything about what to expect. We just knew that it was very pristine and remote and dangerous. And what we didn't know at the time is that the river was really up. Crazy, crazy up. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Yeah. It is on, okay, yeah. River was really, really high. I mean, way higher than it normally is. And our canoe was really, really low. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, it, we had it loaded down with too much gear but, uh, and camping equipment. So I, I just wanted to say something about this. So Kenny and I, you know, have been out on these stories together, which are really, it's a really interesting collaboration when a photographer and a writer go out together. It's rare. It doesn't usually happen in, in magazine journalism, which this is. You know, usually the writer goes out all by himself or herself for a long time, and then eventually the shooter shows up to shoot. In this case, we're, we're in the narrative. We're in the Devil's River. But, I mean, to me, one of the great things about this, I mean, yes, we're launching into, and we don't even really know what we're launching. We don't really have any idea what we're doing. It was grotesquely overloaded canoe. We have not paddled in white water before. Neither of us have, not canoes anyway. Um, we're launching into this, we'll call, it wasn't record heights because the Devils is famous for flash flood. It's very high so that the class twos are class threes and the class threes are class fours. And it's quite serious and you're going down this thing anyway. This is moments after we, so this is to me, Kenny, I mean, it, it, it is such a wonderful photograph and there's so many photographs in this book like this, but what, it, what this does is it captures I mean, it just, it captures the mystery and the danger. Well, we didn't know about the danger yet. We were about to figure right. out about the danger. We didn't know about the danger yet. Danger was coming, <laughs> which you will see. We're going to show you and the you danger. And you hear it too, the deep hear. rumbling sound <laughs> up ahead. But wait, but, but it's, 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 it's just this kinetic piece with full of mystery and danger and, and uh, the thing that we were going into. And we, indeed, it, it, it is one of the most remarkable and beautiful places in Texas where, as they say, you know, you, you know, we would go to pools in the Devil's River where, you know, you can look down 20 feet and see a crawdad. It's, the, it's a gin clear, turquoise colored water. It's just spectacular. Anyway, at this point, it's, it's and it, when we launched into it on our mutual <laughs> adventure, uh, it, was, it, was, it was up and roaring. So, it was. Yeah. It was. And I won't tell the spider story. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah. You know, you're paddling along, it's nice and calm, you hear the birds chirping, and then you hear this deep rumble up ahead, and the water starts getting faster, and so you try to get to the side before you're actually in it, and one of the, one of the deep rumbles was this, Dolan Falls. I hope you guys can note, it's, it's sometimes a little hard to get the scale of this thing. This is the largest waterfall in Texas, nice. by volume. Mm -hmm. It is, it is just absolutely crazy roaring. I mean, you can see sort of how big it is. Those are pretty big trees on the right, but I mean, it's, it's and, it, and it's kind of a, almost, I guess you'd say a half moon shape. Mm -hmm. It's a, sort of a yeah. crescent. But, and I'll, and I'll give it back to you, but just the, we were, this was the classic moment. So now I had read somewhere that if you were approaching, let's say Niagara Falls and the Niagara River, that what you see ahead of you, you don't hear anything, and what you see ahead of you is just a line. Mm -hmm. It's just a straight horizon line. That's all you see. You don't see rapids, you, and yet you were about to go over Niagara Falls. So we're, we knew about Dolan Falls. We knew sort of where it was, but not within a two or three miles, because again, there were no maps. We had nothing to go by. So we're, we're actually sliding down that ramp on the right, right into that. And 
at some point, I looked up and I saw the horizon line, and somewhere in the reptile core of my brain, it says, horizon line bad. <laughs> <laughs> and as Kenny, as Kenny said, and you could sort of hear this thing, kind of like, you know, 20 buses run, you know, like running down a highway somewhere. But anyway, we, we, uh, I, I would say we were 200 feet from that, from actually going into that when we realized what was about to happen to us when we got ourselves out. But again, and I would just comment, again, you know, these photographs are all Kenny's. I'm, I'm the, I'm, I mean, visually here, I'm just uh, along for the ride, but I mean, I have seen many, many pictures of Dolan Falls. I have taken a bunch of them myself because I have run this river on other occasions. I've never seen anything remotely like this. It's the coolest, biggest waterfall in Texas, shot by a great photographer with just an absolute crazy sense of the power of this thing. And also, in particular, the sense that I have anyway, ha having almost gone into there, what yeah, would have yeah. happened to me if I'd gone into it. So. We had to portage around the, the right side, which took forever. We took the wrong we, side. You know, we, we should have gone around the left. We learned later that you go, you portage uh, right, we portage left, right? Yeah. yeah. We portage left which was through a dense forest <laughs> with a canoe with like 400 pounds of camera equipment in it. So anyway. And anyway, when you spend Very a few cool. days in a canoe with somebody, you really get to know them. <laughs> this, this is Sam's paddle. Yeah. It's my I want y'all to appreciate how, the, how well that paddle is being held. <laughs> it's a perfect angle. This was a different story that we did on the 50th anniversary, I think. John Graves, great book, Texas-based book, Goodbye to a River. And so we, we retraced the first, I don't know, couple of days, two or three days. And uh, it, it, was, it was just great because we were camping in some of the places that he talked about in the book. And we, start, we put in at Possum Kingdom Dam where he put in. Exactly the same spot. And there's a shot spot. that Kenny took of me in the boat, right? where the, That's the John Graves shot. And it was right, right around the same time of year, right? Uh, yep. no, November. No, we froze our butts off. So but, but go, go back, though, Kenny. I, I, need, I, need to, I need to comment because that, to me, this to me captures in part the yes. Can you go back? There. Okay. So I, I just wanted to point out again how well that oar is being held um, by the guy in the canoe. No, so here is, here is an example of, I think, you know, from my own primitive understanding of what Kenny does and how Kenny does it. Okay, so this is a shot that he worked. Now, so we, I went out and he was at, I don't know, where were you? Were you, in the, uh, were you in the stern and I'm in the bow or were you in somewhere yeah. else? Yeah, I was in the back. Okay, so this was a worked shot. So he saw this. He saw, in other words, okay, there are these, I like to think of them as like fairy sparkles there on the left. This is something that I, I never saw any fairy sparkles. I never saw that. I never, and that's not an effect. That is not a photoshopped after effect. Kenny, what, Kenny's ability is to see, and he sees what he sees, and what he sees you don't see. I can look at that river all day long, and I will not see fairy sparkles. <laughs> and even though I was instrumental in getting them, I want to point out. But, uh, th but the fact is that that is something that Kenny saw. He saw it. He saw what it could be. He saw the angle of the sun. And... And it's just this absolutely phenomenal kind of magical moment. And not only because we're, we're writing about a, a mythic, it's my favorite single book about Texas. If you all haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's John Graves' Goodbye to a River. It's the best book about Texas. It's wonderful. And it's very mythical and magical from the Comanches to his, you know, eating the squirrels as he's going down the river and everything else. But there's a myth and magic to that book. That, that's the myth and magic right there. And we're, there we are, we're 10 miles below Possum Kingdom Dam, going right where John Graves went, and there you have it, captured in a little, little moment. So this was, what, 2003, was 2004? It, three, four, yeah, yeah. Pre-digital, and so we're shooting film, <clears throat> and so obviously you're not seeing what you're getting, which is, it's totally different than today. I think it's almost better when you can't see what you're getting because you tend to stay in your head more instead of like just wanting to look at the camera right away. So many times I've, I've, I'm looking at the back of the camera and I miss the shot. But it's such a, that's such a critical difference though, right? I mean, so, now, so nowadays you click, look, click, look, click, look, right? Yeah, Digitally, yeah. you didn't see that until when? A you week don't see later? It till, yeah, you know, so you had no home, idea, I mean, so in other words, you, you thought you saw that. 
But you couldn't be sure you saw it until you looked. Exactly. But that's like a... You always get butterflies in your stomach when you're going to pick up the film. Yeah. <laughs> this is along the river. I think that's close to Kichai Creek. Kichai. And the, uh, there were the Ainai tribes and the Kichai <laughs> tribes. And so we, to this day, I call him Ken I. He calls me Sam I. They were just some of the tribes that lived up there and uh, that Graves wrote about in his book. So these two pictures are the oldest pictures in my book, both taken in 1995. And that's a submerged typewriter on the left, and obviously a fishing pole shot on the Brazos River. But I like it because it was the first year I started my business, 1995. And, you know, this, this book isn't laid out as a retrospective or anything, but it actually is from the first year I started to, you know, the, the present day when it was published just last year. But I was going along, you know, following the Brazos River, just trying to pay attention, just, you know, see what I could find. And it was a series of, you know, fishing poles and, environmental portraits and landscapes, and there really is no formula <laughs> about how to approach a shoot like that. You know, you just kind of follow the light. But I'm doing the same exact thing now as I, I, as I was doing back then. The MO hasn't changed. So this book is divided into seven sections, one for each geological region of Texas. And so when I laid out all the pictures that I had, which was at that time 23 years of photographs, film, digital, and everything, we kind of wanted each section to be kind of balanced, you know, to have as many photos as, as the others. And it turned out some of the sections were a little light. And they weren't as strong, you know, the, the photographs weren't as strong. So I had about a year to go back and plug in some of those holes. And about, I counted them up, and about half of the images in the book were taken in that last year. This is uh, Matagorda Bay. I started getting these assignments from Texas Highways and the Nature Conservancy of Texas that were taking me to these exact places that I needed to shoot for the book. It's a great shot. Tonkawa Springs in East Texas, kind of close to Nacogdoches. Okay, so tell, so can you tell the story of that? So how did those feet happen to be there? So I was there for, you know, two or three hours, just, and there was no, no one else there. And finally, people kind of started trickling in, and the water was cold. It's a spring-fed lake. And I didn't really want to go swimming, but I said, what the heck, you know? So I put on my bathing suit and got my swim fins and my camera in the camera housing, water housing. And these girls started showing up and they were jumping off the pier and stuff. And I said, hey, can, can one, of you, one of you guys come over here and, and just hang your legs off? And then they all came over there. <laughs> Much better than I would have thought of, you know. That's just how those good pictures happen sometimes. A lot of good pictures are just lucky, whether the photographer admits it or not. This is another uh, nature preserve, um, Climber Meadow. It's uh, one of the last remnants of Blackland Prairie oh. left in Texas, which used, used to spread from the Gulf Coast all the way up to Canada. And where is this? Where is it, where, what is it, what's That's it near? That's in the uh, prairies and lakes area, so it's a little southwest of uh, Fort Worth. So I was in the Davis Mountains waiting for the light to change. I had this scenic that I wanted to shoot. And it takes a while for the light to change sometimes. And so I was sitting on this rock and I got up to stretch my legs and turned around and I was sitting on the shot. <laughs> Just lichen on a rock. Stars and cotton. I was in... Um, Panhandle area shooting Caprock Canyon. It just happened to be cotton harvest time, and my parents used to pick cotton, and it reminded me of them. And so I had that connection 
to the landscape. And so I was like right south of um, Abilene. And I knew that there were some cotton fields out there. So I got up real early the next morning and drove out and it was just pitch dark and I couldn't see anything. <laughs> so I'm like weaving the car back and forth to see if I could find any cotton fields. And then the full moon started to rise. And between the moon and my headlights, I found this one. So those are, those are head, so cotton is illuminated foreground by your headlights? No, how, how, that's how I found the field. But oh, the, that's how you, the cotton is, uh, and the land is, um, is being lit by the full moon. Which is oh, because like I was going to ask you about that. Because it, it is, you can't figure out how it's being lit. I mean, that's, that was my question yeah, yeah. when I saw it. I was like, how, how did you do that? And it wasn't even that long of an exposure. Wow. I was shooting in high cotton. <laughs> but I mean, you have, but you have, Orion clear and the sunrise clear and you've got moon, moon, I mean, that's quite a piece of, I mean, you know, I've seen Kenny work with, you know, light diffusers in studios so this like, this is some major light diffusion going on there. Yeah, yeah. That's really I cool. I had it pictured a little differently, but I like this one too. Yeah. Pictures, uh, they, they never come out the way you think they're, they're going to come out. They're either better or worse. So I got this assignment from Texas Monthly to go shoot the Blanco River, and that was it. But they wanted it the next day, so I had to get up early in the morning, and I had this plan A spot that I was going to go to where the road crosses the river. I got about a mile from there, and it was blocked off construction. So then I turned around, went to plan B, and that also was inaccessible because of construction. You know. By that time, I was kind of freaking out and just frantically driving around, and I finally found this soccer field next to the river. So I pulled in and got my tripod and camera and just walked down to the river and was setting up the shot, and it, as the sun was coming up, I saw that it was backlit, you know, the river fogs coming up. It had those fall colors. That was in uh, early December. With the tripod or without the tripod? With the tripod. <clears throat> so I put on my long lens, and I, I just loved this angle and everything. And then these deer started swimming across on cue. I mean. <laughs> so was this, would this be near, say, w Wimberley, or where, where, where are we in This Texas? is close to Kyle. Oh, Kyle, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the Lighthouse Rock Formation in Palo Duro Canyon. And I'd photographed it many times before, but never with the stars out. And it just so happened that when I was there, the full moon was going to rise about the same time the sun set. So I took off from the parking lot at about 6 o'clock, and it was still, it was like 106 degrees still outside. And with just my camera, tripod, and a lot, as much water as I could carry. So I get out there, and, you know, the, the sun goes down. And there were a few people, but they, but they took off. And then the moon started to rise, and I was all alone for the rest of the night. And, this image was taken about midnight. And midnight. A, so, so what, again, what, the, 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 the light. So again, you've got full the moon, moon as your light source. Full moon is lighting it. But yeah. what's the light sources on the horizon? That's where uh, some of the other camps were. Oh, oh, I yeah. see. Because you're, you're, you've got an exposure. You're, mm -hmm. you're picking up that light. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, bats and owls were swooping overhead. Mm -hmm. Rattlesnakes were rattling. Coyotes were howling. It was very, <laughs> felt very primal. That's great. So this was about, this was a story, another Texas Monthly story about um, things that wash up on the beach. And so I, got, I get down there and there's just a bunch of seaweed, you know, and logs and jellyfish and stuff. But these, these two guys from the county were picking up trash and one of them handed me this light bulb. And Oh, that's cool, you know. So I just started playing with it. And that's how that one came about. This is called Hurricane Isaac number five. And it's the, the title's kind of deceiving because it's such a tranquil scene with these surfers sitting out there, but they're actually waiting for the next set to come through because this hurricane is going into Louisiana. Hurricane Isaac. And you know, the hurricane's 500 miles away, but 27 hours later, you start to see the pulses in Texas. 
And that, those are the best serve conditions for Texas servers. So just, just in case y'all missed it at Mary Margaret's introduction, Kenny's a, a real surfer, he's been a surfer for a long time, he's a good surfer, he's surfed everywhere, and he's one of these guys who, hurricanes are super good news for him, you know, gets in the, gets in the car, <laughs> loads it up, and heads for the beach. Wherever you head, where do you head? Where's the, where's the, it depends, I guess. Uh, it depends, but South Padre has South usually, Padre. usually the best and most consistent wave. There's my badge. I'm not sure why that's on there. Ah. There's supposed to be more pictures. <laughs> I, can, I can describe them to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Yes, all those, all those. Huh. Okay, well, I think it's a good time for the question and answer, maybe. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for me or Sam? Hmm? The sun. Yeah. So the question was, was that the sun or the moon behind the light bulb? Oh, I actually had the same question because it doesn't seem like you could. So you just put that up to the sun. Yeah. <clears throat> Solar light source. It's pretty great. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're all they're all up and down that river, mm -hmm. river people. <laughs> that Actually, was a pretty yeah. cool experience. That he he had asked about the Graves book of the trip, so we didn't we did not try to duplicate. I mean, the old Graves thing was they were going to build all these dams going down there, and he was going to run the you know the Brazos before they did this. Now, in fact, because of the book, in part, they didn't build a lot of those dams. So. Uh, um, but anyway, we didn't. We, so, so Graves ran it clear to the Gulf. We de definitely didn't do that. But we had we had the three, about three days, four days on on the river, and uh, and and, all, and and it was amazing how, I guess how alive that history seemed to all, all of us that, you know, us back then. And and that was uh, what year did we do that? What year did we do the Brazos? Two thousand five. It was a few years after the Devils, maybe the year after. Yeah. Wait, the the book was published in fifty nine. I think. Yeah. So it must have been. Well, but we had, remember, it was the, it was the anniversary of the writing and not the, oh, anyway, yeah, there yeah. Was, we cheated it somehow. Right. <laughs> right. But it was, uh, uh, but it was interesting for me, uh, for us to be both on this river at the same time to be with, um, and it was, uh, Graves had written about Comanches and it was the first time I'd ever read about Comanches was in his book. He, he wrote about the famous killing of Martha Sherman, which uh, I eventually I wrote a book about the command. Yeah, he wrote a, yeah. Uh, the first time I ever read that, uh, which shocked everybody in the frontier and changed Indian policy and did all sorts of things. But um, so I was off, yeah, back, back in Comanche country there. And that was actually the part of, if you look at where I think the, the most, the single most violent part of the frontier was indeed, if you ask me, Parker County, Palo Pinto, Palo, Palo Pinto County, those counties southwest of Fort Worth, those are where the most violent of all the raids took place. So it was interesting. That was, I guess, my first ride through Comanche country. In really? addition, yeah, for me. So that, yeah. so that planted the seed. That's right. So wow. he, he taught me everything I knew about Comanche. <laughs> yes, sir? Uh, very little. I still shoot it, though, especially when I'm shooting for myself. I do editorial stuff for magazines and commercial work for businesses, corporations, and stuff, and then I shoot for myself. The, the surf book was a pure personal project, and the new book was mainly culled from assignments over the past 23 years. But like I said, I had about a year to go back and fill in the holes, and it ended up being about half the book. But film still looks great, you know, and really when you when you do a high res scan, a high resolution scan of a piece of film, the digital file retains that film quality. You know, the, the grain and, and just the look. It's a, especially with a medium format camera, it just got a different look. The, the relationship of the film to the lens is it's, it's just different that you can't duplicate. 
with a iPhone or you know digital SLR. They're getting close though. It's also still fun to shoot when you're not when you don't see what you're getting. shadow up in the upper right hand corner and I wondered what that was was it a cloud that's uh, vignetting I was using a, a $20 plastic camera for that shot and I couldn't believe it when he when he pulls this thing out it's a Holga a Holga it's a $20 camera and not only that but your camera hit it's, it was all duct taped over it, so it's it's, it's got light cheap, leaks it's the cheapest camera. it's just all kinds of duct tape all over mm -hmm. it it's got like a little pinhole. I don't know what it was, but he pulls that thing out. Anyway, this is if you if you travel with Kenny and you and you see what he does. One of the first things you learn about him is that it is the seeing of the thing. It is not. It is not the. It is not the twenty thousand dollar Hasselblad camera that does it. It's the seeing of things. And the first time I ever saw it was a ba just a basket of peaches that I shot. I said, "It's just unbelievable." It, but it was. He just saw the peaches that way. And it's like the fairy sparkles. I could look at the peaches for a million years, and I'm not going to see them that way. And I'm never going to see the fairy sparkles, but he does. And anyway, I was, so this is a, a sidebar, but the Holga, to me, I really couldn't believe it when you pulled that thing out. Uh, I, it was like I have a, like five or six of them, and, and that's, that was the best one still. And that was the first <laughs> you one have I have five or got. six Holgas? Yeah. That's a big investment. Isn't it like 98 bucks or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Uh, Dark areas in the corners are, are just natural vignetting because the light falls off. It's just darker in the corners because it's a cheap plastic camera. I kind of I kind of like the look though. It does. It does. I agree. What would you say? I would just ask a question on behalf of I guess people here who might also be curious about this. But you know, so much of your book is is big. It's just big like this big. So when you look at, and, and it must be very hard to render a big landscape. So we were just looking at one, and you were talking about how you've got sunrise over here and moonrise behind you and all these other things going on. But how do you, so if you were going to tell someone like me how you approach something this big, this monumental, the kind of West Texas shots that you get, how, what, what do you, how do you approach that? How, how do you do that? How do you see something that big and, and deliver it, I guess? Elliot Erwitt had a great quote, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, it has little to do with what you see and everything to do with how you see it. And another great photographer, Robert Adams, who is a purely landscape photographer, he's got a, he was a great writer too, still is. But he said a, a good landscape photo has geography, autobiography, and metaphor. And each of those by themselves or, you know, it can help, but you put all the, you put all three together and that it, they just reinforce each other to make a, a good photograph. So if and you were to, kinda, for example, go back to, the, go back to that cotton field, which I think is brilliant. It's one of my favorite photos in that whole book. How would you relate what you just said to that particular photo where you got the sunrise and the moonrise and uh, the well, cotton and the stars and everything? I thought about it the night before and thought that it would work. And so that was the plan. And like I said, I thought it would look different than what it, Mm -hmm. the way it came out, but I was still pleased. Yeah, you know, and it, Robert Adams also says that you judge a landscape or a scene based on your, your own history. So, you know, your history and, and what you've seen before and related to kind of informs you about what's important to shoot. And you can put 100 photographers out there and each one will have a totally different scene, you know, it's just... I've also discovered a long time ago that if you really care about what you're shooting, it shows. It, it comes through in the image. There's well, just that, cotton, that little something cotton. intangible. You well, know? you have cotton in your family. I mean, uh, yeah, cotton you're cotton right. In, exactly. In your, in your DNA. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you a different story about the spiders. This is what journalists go through. <laughs> So at some point, we're, we're, we're looking for some place to camp on the Brazos River. And we can't find any place to camp. There's no, I, I don't know why, there's just nowhere. And it's dark. It's getting, it's getting really dark. Yeah. And we're in a canoe, and we don't know where we are, and we can't. And it's, you know, it's sort of private land up on either side. So in Texas, you don't want to get shot. I mean, that was always what a, And the devils, in fact, that was something we were aware of. We, we had heard people taking pot shots and 
we didn't really want to get shot. So you have to make that whatever it is, 19 mile paddle the first day to make sure you don't get shot. But anyway, yeah. so in order to not get shot or whatever, we, we found this one uh, little island. Mm -hmm. And that island had grass about this tall, but at least you could see your way clear to a, putting a tent, kind of mushing the grass down and putting the tent down. Mm -hmm. And as we were doing this, the darkness had fallen. And, oh, I can remember. So Kenny is out. And this is when you're with Kenny. He's out working it, right? I mean, I'm just a guy who can, like, I have a notebook, right? So I may be taking notes, you know, uh, China berries look great or whatever. I'm, I'm making a note, right? And Kenny's out. Well, the sun's going down, you know. So the sun is going down. Photographers get nervous when the, when the well, sun starts to go down. They don't, they not only running around. Not only do you get nervous, but you get excited because the light is cool. Right. It's not only cool, but you've got about 18 seconds. Then. Anyway, so he's exactly. working it. And I'm trying to do the tent, as I recall. And I'm realizing that this island has about 500,000 spiders on it. And they're all this big. I'm, okay, maybe that big. Do you but know what kind big. they were? What? Do you know what kind they were? Uh, do you? No. But they would, they would remind you of a wolf spider, kind of. Yeah. Maybe not quite that menacing looking, but there was a million of them. And now, okay, now, so, it's, <laughs> so, so Kenny's out of work, so now it's like too late. This is it. This is it. So we pitched the tent on the grass with the millions of spiders. And, and you've never seen people be more careful zipping up the nylon zipper <laughs> in the tent, you know, as we, it's like diving in, zip the thing down, avoid the spiders. But, uh, it was reminded of it. Just, anyway, that's that, that, that's a good spider spider story. You can tell the spider other spider island. Uh, this way we called it Spider Island. That's right. It's, uh, and uh, and in okay. fact, it was fine because we because inside the the one mil. It's amazing to me always when you're camping, right? That what the one millimeter of nylon does. <laughs> it's a great defense against the what's out there. I mean, not that it would save you if a mountain lion wanted to eat you, but but against spiders, <laughs> it was very good. Anyway, it was a. It was typical, and I wanted to say something about that because a lot of this, a lot of the, uh, the stuff here is you on assignment, mm -hmm. and I had the privilege to be on assignment with him three different times, one covering the legendary campaign of Tony Sanchez, which is not photographed <laughs> here, but but watching him, you know, work it. I mean, he work, it's it's a constant working of the physical environment around you, and and not only that, and then I'll shut up. But I mean, not only that, but uh, uh, once again, and he's always seeing things that I don't see. And you know, I'm not a, I'm a, not a photographer. I'm a writer. But I would these are these are whatever is being worked, whatever angle, whatever light, whatever. You know, something like that cotton field. I mean, I would never. I, I can't even understand the vocabulary involved in being able to embrace that. Anyway, yes, back way back. Yes. First off, I'd like to thank both of you for your work. I've been a fan for quite a while. I loved Empire of the Summer Moon. The last photo about the one that you said was taken during Hurricane Isaac, could you speak more to the atmospheric conditions that you were seeing? Well, you know, even though the storm was 500 miles away, the, the sky had this kind of different glow to it. And it was in the morning. And oftentimes, you know, at, at the coast, you get dramatic skies in the morning. And it was just real, really tr tranquil, except for when a set of waves would come through. But, yeah, I actually took some photographs for my, for my surf book on that same trip. I was waiting for a good hurricane to come through so I could take photos of it because you don't put out a Texas surf book without a hurricane photo. I mean, you just don't do it. And so the publisher, UT Press, was like, we got to go, man. If, 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 if this doesn't get done by the end of September, we're going to have to wait another year. To, you know, to get it in line, to, to be printed and everything. And just right on cue, you know, it, like, it was like September the 12th. Hurricane Isaac came in. And so I, I, I got that picture and several others that made it in the book. And it wasn't like a huge hurricane swell or anything, but I missed that one. Uh, the, the, actually, the biggest wave ever ridden on the Texas coast that was photographed was during Hurricane Katrina. And these were like 20 to 30 foot waves with just beautiful blue water. You know, it's I've, I've seen pictures of it. But anyway, sometimes you, uh, you don't get the shot. You just got to have to live with it. <laughs>
the spider. Okay. So we're, we're just taken off on the Devil's River. It's early in the morning. We're just pushed off. And on the side of the river in, in the weeds, there were these beautiful, thick, white, glowing spider webs. And I was like, that'll make a good picture. And Sam's like, Let's go. you want to stop? I was like, no, we just started. You know, let's go. And well, we never saw another one. That whole, that whole trip. We, we still talk about to this day. I mean, it was for the Devil's just, River. Had, that picture. I mean, we just pushed up right in the, the in fact the picture that he showed. The one that I said was mysterious and dark and danger and the things that are to come. That was taken about you know, five minutes after that. But that's that's what we we had pushed off. We had been loading this canoe. The canoe had about this much freeboard. It was all just <laughs> overloaded, and there were, and we're whoosh, we're out in this kind of like Mr. Toe's wild ride, of, which is kind of what it was, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of remind you of Mr. Yeah. Toe's wild ride. The whole thing was, and we're like, whoa, here we go, and then wait, look at that, and whoosh, on by, and we still talk about it. It was like the spider web that we never got. But anyway, <laughs> but it was uh, anyway. I've got several stories like that. I, I don't like to talk about them though. <laughs> That's two spider stories, really. Anyone else? I think there's some books for sale, too. Yeah? Right there. You can get Sam to sign one. Yeah. Be worth the price of the book right there, just to get Sam to sign it. <laughs>